Mojela, are known to many of us as corporate ladies that have broken the ceiling so that many of us can come through. They decided to invest in agriculture, particularly at a primary level in South Africa and Lesotho rural areas. As corporate and successful businesswomen in their own right, they were not deterred by the communal land tenure system in these two countries that have a lot, as we know, of complexity and at times scare a lot of would-be investors away. They understood the importance of strengthening food systems as the ammunition to fight poverty, unemployment, and underdevelopment. They saw an opportunity of industrializing these spaces, which are dislocated from the current economic zones of our country. They worked with local leaders and communities, but more importantly, they worked with Mbogod, the women who till the land for survival and for food security purposes at household and at local level. Today, if you go to Tendane in the Eastern Cape, you will see some of the villages boasting of maize production. It is not only the fields, but today there's the storage facility, the silos that we see in the maize belt, particularly in Northwest Mpumalanga and the Free State. Now you can see the silos in Ntana. Kamuhelo Bombe, a young woman in the poultry industry in Gauteng, when we had a youth webinar in June, she actually, in telling her story of how she entered the industry, learning from her grandmother, who was actually a small scale farmer in Limpombo, in Gauteng, she saw the opportunity of getting into the poultry industry. In that webinar, she actually encouraged young people to hustle, to look for opportunities and have a drive if they are to succeed in the agricultural sector. From primary production, she actually has started processing by cutting up pieces and selling it directly to the market. Yes, this is one of those young women who is actually making us proud as a sector because she has entered this industry and immediately saw the opportunities in the value chain. Bringing in the indigenous knowledge system. Ms. Nelly Iswama Lungani, who stays in Gauteng but come from Limpompo, learning from her grandmother's knowledge, created one of the pharmaceutical products known as Slimtone out of avocado seeds. She, her story was very interesting. That one of the things that enthused her in starting to experiment from the grandmother's idea was when she was struggling with weight after giving birth to her kids. And she wanted to have, you know, a slim figure and thought, what did my grandmother say? And then she remembered and started. What might have started as a solution for herself is now a solution that is in the market and assisting other women. I have highlighted these women not because they are the only ones in the agriculture and agribusiness space. There are many women who we know who have entered the sector and caused positive disruptions. Yesterday with the portfolio committee, we visited Freyheit. One of the women, Mpuncha uh, Pigari, is actually now big in the Pigari market and she's even thinking of creating a feed industry for her pigs, but also to sell to other farmers. These are the positive stories that we need not tire to tell every time. These are the women who actually encourages us to find even more women who are participating in the sector and have made it. But did they make it because it was easy? I would be the first one to say no. There have been constraints and challenges that these women have faced. 
Some of these are the challenges that we're addressing as government working with the industry to support women in agriculture. The one that most of us would know and actually shout out is the issue of land access and ownership, which remains an important productive asset that women need and any other farmer actually. Having shared the story of Notomato and Weephold, communal areas are actually growth areas for production. We need to develop strategies on how we can ensure a better legal framework that will ensure access and equity. As government, we've developed and adopted the land allocation and beneficiary selection policy. In that policy, as it will be explained by one of the panelists, we target that 50% of agricultural land that state disposes must go to women. One of the challenges in the land access is actually about access to information. Where do I go to apply? That's a question that we often hear from a number of women. On the 700,000 hectares of land that we released as a state last year, I just want to indicate that out of it, 78 farms totaling 53,000 hectares have been released to 217 women beneficiaries. We know that some of the women will benefit through the land that has been released to communities that they've been using for a number of years, but now affirming the legal right for them to use. Are we happy about the numbers? Certainly not. These are the numbers that we continue to grow and would want to grow because for us, women remain the bedrock of strengthening our food systems at local level. Other constraints that women have faced, even the ones that I've mentioned, is access to financial services, which is affordable, particularly for the sector such as ours. And a majority of them will tell you how they struggle for production uh, credit in our development financial institutions, as well as our commercial banks. The third area is extension and advisory services who are actually not enough to be able to support the many farmers that we have in this country, particularly smallholder farmers. The issue of access to markets is another area of concern that majority of women will actually raise as a constraint. Technology and digitization is another area. We have the Agricultural Research Council that support us with new technologies for varieties that we need so that we can be on the cutting edge. But how do we harness this information, particularly for women and in the language that they would understand? As we know that as the country and globally, there is a change and the demand of technology access and digitization, how do we ensure that we also use this to deal with the climate challenge that we face globally. Tools of trade, you will hear this as a question that women will ask. I would have been able to be this far if I had a tractor, if I had a, a plow, if I had a planter. So the tools of trade are important for the production for women in particular, like any other farmers, of course. But how do we make sure that we target women in terms of the support. We've started our food uh, support production unit, our S FSPSU, but they're not yet accessible to women. And these are the disruptions positively we must cause. The issue of information on the sector generally and the understanding of the value chains and areas of entry becomes important. What then have we done in addressing some of these? I'll just mention one. I've mentioned the land issue on what we're doing around it. The other panelists will share with you in detail what we're doing on issues of financing uh, in particular. 
we have started women in agro-processing and agribusiness. Through this program, we want to expand women's knowledge and entry into the agribusiness sector. We're doing this in order to ensure that we also look at support mechanisms for women in the agribusiness area. A majority of us seated here believe Hello. that in agriculture is the ability of land. Yes, when it comes to primary production, this is important. But entry in the industry as a whole can be achieved through our participation at various levels. For instance, we can source commodities from those who produce for processing. Like one of the ladies, a former teacher in Limpompo who processed a beetroot and is now competing actually with one of the known brand, the cool brand in the spa shops in Limpompo and Pumalanga. The other area is in the logistics, the movement of good from farm to the market is another area that is an entry point which women need to look at. It doesn't mean that if you want to be in the agricultural sector, you only need to be a farmer, but you can actually be in the logistics industry. You can be in the distribution uh, centers. You can also participate in the cold storage and grain storage facilities. So in looking at this area, of agribusiness and agro-processing. These are the issues that we'd want to actually entice women to participate in, but also to look at how we unblock certain issues that are there. We're currently working on the agriculture and agribusiness master plan. And we'd want to make sure that the issue of gender parity is actually ingrained or rather ingrained in the master plan because we know that women are part and parcel of our society of our economies and of our entire livelihoods and therefore if we leave women behind our society will not progress it is for this reason we participate in the generation equality globally because we believe that we need to have an egalitarian society where men and women are actually equal in our society, both in terms of participation and even in opportunities that are created and that present themselves in. So today, as we engage with you, we want to hear your views on how better can we support you as women in this sector so that you can thrive. Thank you very much, Dawn. And I'm sure in Food from Zanzi, you'll be able to make a platform where every week you give a story about one successful woman in the agricultural industry. Because in that way, we are profiling what women can do, but we're also encouraging many to enter the sector. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Minister Toku Didiza. And I must say that at Food for Mzanzi, we champion women in agriculture. And it's a big part of our content strategy and the stories that we share on a daily basis on Food for Mzanzi. Um, and I must say, if anyone on this call ever doubted the impact women play in this dynamic sector, then they better watch this space because you've highlighted a number of women that are um, in this field. And, um, and I know that there are more than 500 participants on this call and tuning in from the website that are as passionate and as dynamic as the woman that you have just referred to. We are looking forward to thrashing out all the aspects that you've highlighted this morning, especially around accessing land and finance, markets and information, and especially information in language, language in, the, in the language that women can actually understand. Um, we're also looking forward to highlighting how women farmers can adapt to new innovation and mechanization. And I do see that there are a number of questions and comments streaming in on all of our platforms. We will have a session later this afternoon at around about 12.30, where we will take your comments and questions for the various speakers. In the interest of time, I now call on Ms. Gloria Mosito, the managing, the, she's the manager and responsible for beneficiary selection and allocation policy 
in the department, and she will share with the participant today government's land reform program, specifically focusing on the beneficiary selection and land allocation policy. Thank you once again, Minister. And now over to you, Ms. Gloria. Thank you, Don, and thank you to the minister. Good morning. Am I audible? Can everybody hear me? Yes, you are audible and you're welcome to share your, your presentation, Ms. Mosito. All right, thank you. Um, can you see it from the side? Yes, we can see your presentation. You can go ahead with your slideshow and we are oh. very happy to have you here. All right, thank you so much, Don. Um, while listening to the minister's keynote speech, I also went through the comments on the side, Don, and I noticed how many people are actually interested in how to get access to land and how to address um, landlessness of, uh, throughout the country. And I'm happy to be presenting to this panel um, the beneficiary selection and land allocation policy which was approved in December 2020, and which we are happy as a department to actually give word out there and, and let the people out there know how much the department is doing to, to ensure that women, the youth, and the people with disability, living with disabilities out there are, are gaining equitable access to land through this particular um, uh, policy. Thank you so much once again. My name is Loria Musito. Um, I'm going to be going straight into the presentation. This is just a brief outline of um, what my presentation entails. I promise it's not going to be long, although it's very packed with detailed information on what women are mostly interested in, especially in regards to access to land. The, this policy was, was formulated um, uh, on, on the backdrop of the white paper on South for South African land policy. Um, of 1997, which stated that the purpose of land redistribution program is to provide the poor with land for residential and productive purposes in order to improve their livelihoods. Land and land redistribution is intended to assist the urban and the rural poor, as well as farm workers, labor tenants, and the emergent farmers. However, what we noticed is that despite the various land reform policies and efforts which was initiated after the 1994 period, there were still more, in, in more than two decades later, there was still a lot of inequity um, of land ownership. And that has left a relatively huge impact. And this, this was largely, largely attributed to the major challenges of land reform, foremost of which was the slow pace of land redistribution and tenure reform. Now, this was a notable uh, 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 um, a problem that needed to be addressed. And as a result, we also realized that there was a number of Black South Africans, particularly women, who continue to be landless and are excluded from participating in sustainable agriculture. And they live in unsustainable human settlements without sufficient livelihood resources. As a department, we couldn't just sit back and not address this because it is our mandate to actually address the problems that are, that are, that are facing our rural poor communities. So the last, uh, 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 um, the, the straw that broke the camel's back was when the final report on the presidential advisory came, uh, uh, panel um, on land reform, which was published on the 4th of May in 2019, noted that a more systematic approach was needed to redress and correct the ills within which democratic dispensation and the vast majority of South Africans are eligible for land reform, but a few are provided with the actual access to land. Therefore, the question of who should be selected as beneficiaries emanated. We also had to address the question as to who should be eligible to get the land, who is not eligible. And of central importance, we had to also identify that there is a need to specify in the policy who uh, or how, how the scarce resources are going to be rationed and spread across the competing needs. How the beneficiary selection from a pool of applicants was going to be decided upon. It was for this reason that the policy on beneficiary selection and allocation was developed. 
colleagues and panelists in order to, to address all of these um, problems or challenges that were identified in the uh, uh, presidential advisory panel for land reform. We developed a, a, a clear criteria in the current uh, beneficiary selection and land allocation policy. The criteria that is stating that its principles is to promote the conditions which enable the previously disadvantaged persons and the target groups to access land on an equitable basis, to reach out to women, the unemployed agricultural graduates, the youth in the agricultural sector to access land and the associated agri processing value chain opportunities, to create a credible, transparent system of land allocation and beneficiary selection through the creation of an online application system the National Application Register or database, and an establishment of land allocation and selection panels. These are all aimed at driving transparency around uh, selection and allocation of land. These are all aimed at making uh, 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 the, the process of apply, applying for land easier and more accessible. Instead of you having to uh, 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 travel from wherever you are to a district office, you would then be able to uh, submit your application on, on, on the online system uh, as, 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 as one of the principles that this policy is advocating for. It also wants to ensure that the diverse land needs are addressed through the land redistribution programs, such as agricultural production, common ages, human settlement, and other needs. So this policy recognizes that the, de the department is not is not only focused on agricultural land for production purposes, but there's also a need to address the human settlement uh, 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 gap, which means we would have to, as a department, acquire land for purposes of human settlement. To promote conditions which will enable a, a selected beneficiary to graduate and produce at a level that matches the maximum potential of the allocated land. This would mean that we don't just take the land allocated to a woman and say we have achieved. No, the, 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 the policy has, has elements that are saying as a department, we would have to also help this woman grow from a, 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 a small scale farmer to a commercial farmer, bearing in mind the maximum potential of the land that is allocated to them. So there is a, also a graduate program that is, that is advocated for through this policy, which would mean that there are certain courses and, 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 and skills development programs that the department will ensure that we put our women through. To rekindle the class of, uh, of, of commercial black farmers that was systematically destroyed in the 1913 Natives Land Act is one of the uh, principles of this policy. This policy also wants to ensure that the rural poor, the landless, and the poor municipalities and peri-urban residents gain access to land. Minister and fellow panelists, as well as uh, uh, attendants of, 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 this, of this webinar, I want to share with you that the objectives of this policy is to provide a fair, credible, transparent process and criteria for selection of beneficiaries for land allocation and leasing of state properties. We want to rekindle the class of black commercial farmers. We want to support municipalities and to promote accountability and transparency within the department in allocating state assets. We want to ensure that a qualified, suitable, deserving candidate gains access to land on an equitable basis and to ensure a special targeted group of land reform beneficiaries, such as the youth, the women, and the people living with, uh, with, with, with disabilities, as well as military veterans, gain access to land. Amongst the main objectives of this policy is also to make sure that we establish an independent land allocation panel, which will preside over the selection of suitable beneficiaries or suitable candidates for land allocation. This is for purposes of transparency and to provide a standardized national land application system to ensure a fair and transparent process of transition selection. The special targeted groups in terms of this policy are the following. And it really gives me greatest pride to say that women are at the top of our list in making sure that we that we 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 provide access to land to them as the main targeted group we are targeting women who either have basic farming skills 
such as those who would have learned from their grandmothers, like the minister was talking, was, was telling us in, in her opening speech, such as those who probably have just entry level skills into agriculture and have the necessary passion and willingness to grow in this industry. We want to grant them access to land and to ensure that the women headed households with no or very limited access to land have support from the department, even for subsistence production. And we are making sure that we advance them to grow to commercial farmers. If the passion is there and the will is there, the department is also there to nurture this and grow it. The youth is also one of our targeted groups. This also includes unemployed agricultural graduates. These are the targeted groups in that uh, they will, these, they are, these are, are, are meant to be participants in the department's enterprise development, incubation, apprenticeship programs, and agricultural paraprofessionals. This is where, as I indicated, the skills and development training that the, the, the department wants to afford these, these, these people will be now brought in to grow them to commercial farmers. People living with disabilities are also one of our target, uh, target groups. These are people that we, 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 we know have largely been marginalized uh, and have been looked upon as those that are you know, limited in terms of performing. We as a department are saying no, People living with disabilities are not necessarily incapable of, 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 of entering the sector and proving themselves to be capable of growing uh, the economy of the country through agriculture. We are also looking at unemployed military veterans to support them in the, in the agricultural industry. This policy proposes that 50% of allocation of agricultural farming land under the redistribution program to smallholder farmers will be granted to women. 40% will be granted to the youth and 10% will be granted to the people living with disabilities. The eligibility criteria for you to qualify uh, is as follows. We are looking at previously disadvantaged South African citizens. Obviously you would have to be 18 and above. We are looking at women, youth and persons living with disabilities as indicated, qualifying unemployed uh, military veterans, we are looking at a natural or a juristic person. This means you can also come in as a group of women who have formed yourself into either a cooperative, a company, or any type of juristic person, and you have the necessary passion, the necessary uh, uh, elementary skill, then you apply for access to land. We grant you access to land. We grant you the, the necessary support system for you to grow. Um, this policy also ensures that spouses to public servants are, are, are allowed to apply for access to land. And former public servants who have successfully served a cooling off period of 24 months, uh, politicians holding public office who have successfully served a cooling off period of 12 months, and communal farmers and township dwellers, as, as well as state land residents and individuals. We are excluding the following people. This policy is not going to benefit previously advantaged citizens, non-South African citizens, current and previous beneficiaries of the land redistribution programs, farmers or individuals or legal entities that are currently leasing a state property, um, current public servants, pa politicians holding uh, public office who have served a cooling period of, who have not served a cooling period of 12 months. The land is going to be advertised through print media, regional radio stations in order to reach as many people as possible and to ensure transparency and equitable public process to eradicate any form of fraud, nepotism or favoritism. There are going to be provincial panel uh, uh, selection panels which will facilitate the site inspection, the shortlisting, the conduct, and, and they will conduct interviews and recommend the applicants for allocation uh, of farms to the national panel. The national panel will then do uh, 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 consider recommendations from the provincial panel and make recommendations to the department approving authority for final decision. As part of modernization process, an online land offer and application system is being finalized. 
which will enable landowners who are also willing to make their land available or to donate it to the state uh, for purposes of this uh, uh, program to do so. So the relevant forms will be available online or in a provincial uh, district office of the department for access to, uh, to people. This, the current implementation of this, of this policy or, 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 or of, of, of these views of the department uh, in, in, in the previous um, financial year is that the department is aligning itself to a gender response, planning guides, and the beneficiary selection and land allocation policy is targeted to allocate 11,987 hectares to females across the country under the land redistribution program. In the end, a total of 56,869 hectares were allocated to different categories um, of which 34,156 hectares, which translates to 60%, were allocated to 34 women. At an average of about 1,000 hectares per female. These are our achievements in the financial year of 2020-2021. For land tenure reform purposes, the department managed to acquire 7,127 hectares for this financial year period, which we benefited a total of 450 individuals, of which 238 were women. In the current financial year, there are also 1,636 hectares already transferred to six labor tenant families with a total of 97 beneficiaries under the land tenure reform. From the 97 beneficiaries, there are 42 females. This is just a brief outline of the achievements uh, you know, spread through the provinces. Now, mainstreaming of women is already part of the approved annual performance plan. 50% of land uh, is targeted to be located under the land redistribution of, uh, 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 program of 2021-2022. Some of the farms that are acquired under the land redistribution program are deliberately acquired for allocation to women. The adverts for allocation are explicit that only women are allowed to apply. The department is in the process of calling for nominations of people who are to serve on provincial and land allocation panels and women shall be included to serve in these panels. A limited number of applications from, of applications from prioritized categories um, is, is received from women. These are now the challenges that we are experiencing on the ground, which I would really like to call upon um, the attendance of, 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 of this webinar to really try and you know, do their best to help us achieve what we, are, what we are targeting. Because if we are targeting women and we don't get applications from women, it becomes difficult to achieve. We are currently getting a limited number of applications from the prioritized categories that are indicated, which are women, youth, and people with disabilities. We call upon to get more of these applications. We are getting invasion of farms where land has been advertised for allocation. For example, approximately nine farms were invaded in the Northwest through an orchestrated plan just immediately after it was advertised. Then it becomes difficult to start with the allocation process because for you to allocate a person there while you know that there are invaders, you are basically putting the life of that person at risk. Especially if it is a woman, it means you need to do the necessary process to remove the invaders before you can get the, 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 the allocated a, a woman onto that farm. The other problems we are expecting is that we are experiencing is poor quality business proposals from applicants. This calls upon us as women to really, you know, try and take serious the, 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 the opportunities that we are being granted and, and draft credible business proposals that are going to be impressive and that are going to show that we, we do have the passion to getting into the business that we are proposing to get into. Some applicants are also uncomfortable providing their bank statements with the personal information to the department, which should be, uh, which is required because then it, it will help us to, 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 to see that you have capacity to utilize the farm effectively. Branding certificates are mostly belonging to the men. A woman would bring in 
uh, and say I've got a certain number of cattle. When we ask for a branding certificate, the branding certificate is registered in the name of a man. So you, you realize that because of the patriarchal background that our society has had, um, women do not have their own, uh, have not taken ownership of their own, you know, branding certificate and stock. We call upon women to actually register their own branding certificates and bring in their own, you know, uh, uh, um, documents when they are applying for land, for access to land under the land reform uh, program. What can we do better as, 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 a, as a department? Um, specific farms will continue to be reserved for women. This is one aspect that we want to really improve upon, to reserve specific farms for women and to ensure that even in the advert we are categorically stating that this is reserved for women applicants only. Women will be assisted through the provincial departments of agriculture to compile credible business plan in order to qualify for category three commercial farms. Beneficiary selection process will run concurrently with the land acquisition process so that farms are immediately occupied upon acquisition to avoid invaders. The department is also to develop a protocol that will empower women to have branding certificate issued in their names. Furthermore, a section that deals with the issuing of branding certificate is also to be engaged in order to make provision for joint certificates where women are co-owners in livestock so that at least your name also reflects on the branding certificate. The department will also ensure that the branches that deal with enterprise development and cooperatives are, assist women to formalize their farming operations so that financial records that can be in the names of the farming enterprise and not individual names will minimize the, the reluctance to disclose personal bank statements as proof of ability or cap capacity to operate farms when an application is being submitted. Thank you so much, Minister and attendants. Thank you, Dawn. Thank you so much, Ms. Gloria Musito, for your presentation. I must say, I knew this topic was going to be a hot one, but the, at the rate that the questions are streaming in, I'm actually worried that we won't have enough time to respond to everyone. I have, however, highlighted a few questions that I'd like to maybe just present. Um, in the meantime, Ms. Musito, if you can just um, look at them in the chat group as well and respond to a few of them. Um, Farid Kasim saying we are experiencing problems in urban agriculture with access to land and especially with municipalities and the metro to access land in urban areas for agriculture. Um, Ms. Muchereni also saying is there any provision for migrant women to access land and financial assistance? I am using my backyard to grow vegetables, layers and broilers. I feel limited to expand because I can't access finance and afford land. We have another comment here saying from Voice of Disability, also saying don't talk about disabled people, but include us in real terms. So these are just some of the questions that are coming through on the chat, on the chat rooms. Um, we will be able to address it later on. I just wanted to highlight some of the questions that came through as you were talking, Ms. Musito. In the interest of time, I know we are rushing things, um, but please bear with us. We would like to just finish all the, all the presentations and then we will engage further. I now call upon our next presenter, who is Ms. Elder uh, Matiti Mta, Mtiza, sorry for my pronunciation there. Uh, she is the program manager responsible for blended finance, cost, and the Ilama Litama within the department. Um, she will now share with the woman on how, woman on this platform, how you can access funding for your specific business. Over to you now, Ms. Elder. Thank you, Program Director. Good morning, Minister. Good morning, panelists and all dignitaries, women in attendance. My name is Eldam Kiza. Um, and as has been introduced, I am the program manager responsible for the cash spent in the Malitzema in the Department of Agriculture and Reform and Rural Development. I'm going to be sharing with you the these um, funding programs. I don't know if you're able to see my screen. Yes, we can see your screen. You're more than welcome to continue your presentation. Thank you. Um, the CASP and Dilema Litzema, actually CASP was introduced in 2004. 
to respond to the gap that resulted due to the closure of the agricultural credit board. Um, the agricultural credit board at the time provided supports which were backed up by extension supports from the ARC, uh, from CSIR, as well as agricultural colleges and schools. These cuts in funding for these institutions compounded by the closure of the agricultural credit board resulted in their services not being provided to the farmers and also leading to the new class of farmers post 1994 not receiving any supports from these institutions. Without these supports, it also became impossible for new black farmers and beneficiaries of land reform to access credit or other means of support. Although government was making strides to provide land, and you have also received the presentation by Ms. Musito that the intentions to provide land still continues, land alone as an asset would not be productive if the means to making it productive were absent. CASP was therefore created to continue and contribute towards ensuring that Africans at every level of farming and in the agricultural value chain get universal access to agricultural supports. It is aimed, it is a conditional grant, the Comprehensive Agricultural Support Program, uh, which is aimed at providing a favorable supportive agricultural services environment for the com farming community, particularly for our subsistence, smallholder and black commercial farmers within the strategically identified commodities. Um, it is targeting uh, beneficiaries of land reform and other black producers who have acquired land through private means and are engaged in value adding enterprises. We also use it to revitalize colleges of agriculture into centers of excellence. Um, our objective with this program is really to deliver on a wide range of, of e economic, social, as well as environmental benefits. On the economic front, we are expecting to produce higher levels of productive efficiencies on these farms, create on-farm and off-farm jobs, increase incomes and wealth in the rural economy. We are also hoping that as the momentum increases in provision of support through CASP, significant amount of domestic as well as foreign investment would also be attracted to these lands um, and also capital to continue developing uh, these farms. Okay. Okay. Can we just ask that all the speakers, sorry for interrupting you. Um, I just want to make sure that everyone who is a panelist, please mute their mics. Thank you. Um, on the social benefits, um, we are also hoping that CASP would contribute to household and national food security as food production increases at both household and national level, uh, resulting in significant reduction in poverty, improving living standards also in rural communities. As a result, the issues around crime, violence, and political instability would then be um, eradicated through uh, self-reliant, self-feeding households. Um, in terms of the environmental benefits, we are hoping that it would be guiding farmers on how to farm responsibly and promote ecologically sustaining, sustainable farming activities. We deliver this program through six pillars. Um, we provide on and off farm infrastructure support. We provide knowledge and information management, which would include record keeping, which would include um, knowledge in terms of markets and how to access markets. Um, we also provide technical and advisory services where we strengthen extension support. We do farmer training and capacity building. Um, we also provide market and business development support. The sixth pillar was branded as MAFISA and it was delivered through intermediaries to ensure that small holder producers in particular access microfinance scheme. Um, we are targeting the hungry, previously disadvantaged subsistence smallholder and distressed farmers as I had mentioned, entrepreneurs, 
youth, women, and people with disabilities. Um, you would also notice that government policy requires that 50% of supported beneficiaries on any program should be women, um, also should be youth. So to the extent that these programs are being evaluated in terms of acceptance um, within their limited resources, we need to make sure that these targets are actually met. Um, we had done an impact evaluation study, as I had indicated, this program was delivered in 2004 and in 2014, 15, we commissioned UP, uh, University of Pretoria through the Business Enterprise Unit to do an impact evaluation study. And what came out, which was interesting, was that about 42% of supported, there was a cohort of about 451 supported farmers, which were part of the, uh, the, the sample study. And of that 42% was uh, projects or farms owned by women. But what was also interesting was that only 29% of the total cohort was managed by women, meaning that some assets which are women owned, women employed men to manage and run their farms. The examples and the pictures you see are some of the work that we have done through this conditional grant. And how do you access it? The implementation is done through the departments of agriculture. And you would see advertisements on an annual basis, particularly around May, June, um, and, uh, uh, announcing the supports and an application is lodged either with an extension officer or in the district agricultural office to be able to access the fund. In the interest of, of time, I would not go through this eligibility criteria but we have a pamphlet also on CASP that we can share. Um, we have also categorized sub, uh, beneficiaries in the sector so that we have targeted response programs for them. Um, CASP and Ilima Letzima is the conditional grant programs that are providing uh, infrastructure, as I had indicated, training, inputs. And because it's a 100% grant, it is a developmental fund which would be provided to farmers whose turnover is below a million uh, per annum. So it becomes important because these are the farmers who would not necessarily be able to access any credit finance from banking institutions or any credit offering institution. So to the extent that you have been assisted, you have been capacitated and you are able to produce to a turnover of above a million per annum, you are then eligible to access blended finance. But we also have found out that the banking sector are able to advance loan funding to enterprises that are beginning to show a turnover of above 500,000 per annum. So that becomes the entry point for blended finance, um, which provides also a grant portion of the total funding that you need. Now, what is blended finance? It is an instrument that we have uh, created to leverage private funding so that our rent goes an extra mile. Um, we are able to sign agreements with these institutions. So you would not access grant on a standalone. It has to always be paid with a loan, which means that you need to be solvent and meet the minimum requirement by those financing institutions because the grant does not have any financial returns expected, you are also expected to abide by some of the terms and conditions in ensuring that you apply the funds for the purposes they were intended for and where land has been acquired through this blended finance, you do not have the latitude to sell land on your own without the permission of the state or first right of refusal by the state. The goal of blended finance is really to support commercialization of black producers because one of the key uh, um, re recommendations or, or findings that came from the impact study was that only 31% of the farmers that were supported by CASP were commercial. So we needed to advance and accelerate programs that would commercialize black producers so that you are able to sustain uh, food security moving forward. Um, so blended finance is closing that gap. 
Um, it also supports enhancement of production and agro-processing and ensure a critical mass of participation of black producers in these uh, uh, value chains. We are accelerating land reform and also trying to grow the economy, create sustainable employment and transform the sector. As I had indicated, really the goal is really to increase meaningful participation of black producers and majority black owned enterprises owning and controlling the agricultural values chain. We cannot speak of food security if we cannot ensure that the majority of commercial producers of food is also coming from black producers. We have the agriculture and agro-processing master plan. It has outlined the commodities that we are prioritizing and these have been analyzed and we are able to know if a particular growth is realized per commodity, what does it mean in terms of jobs? What does it mean in terms of the growth of the sector and contribution to the GDP? So that is a selective choice, which we believe is actually going to grow um, the economy and the sector. Who qualifies? You have to be South African citizen. And for blended finance, because we're talking about majority black owned enterprises, where there are joint ventures, we are not expecting a JV partner to have more than 40% stake in that entity, but not less than 26%. We want to see a new type of a farmer who takes care of his farm workers. Um, if we are to eradicate poverty, farm workers must also enjoy real benefits in the, in, in the farms that they, 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 they labor on. And we want those enterprises that are approved to provide 10% farm worker profit sharing. Uh, in our workplaces, we all get the 13th check or performance bonuses and these vulnerable groups never really receive such, and they just create wealth for the farm owners. Um, so a new caliber of a commercial farmer should be that one who takes care of his employees. Uh, so this is one of the non-negotiables. If it is not in place, the transaction is not fit to benefit from blended finance. With regard to youth, women, and people and with disabilities, I have already indicated, and you'll see with the scorecard, what the percentages are for a transaction to be recognized as black or uh, as women owned, uh, as it were. We are having a qualification criteria. Every institution that partners with the Department for Blended Finance will have to use this qualifying criteria to evaluate transactions that are worthy of blended finance. Um, we are looking at sustainability, so they have to be commercially viable and, uh, uh, transactions or business plans. We are looking at sector focus. They have to be focusing on the commodities we have prioritized. We have included forestry and aquaculture um, as uh, sectors that would also add, accelerate uh, land reform and also grow the agricultural sector as well. As well. Um, there has to be geographical spread. It cannot be concentrated in one province. Um, we are looking at startups, expansions, greenfields, brownfields, as well as acquisitions. Due diligence would be the responsibility of financing institutions. So if you do not pass the due diligence phase, your transaction would not be supported. And when it is rejected by the bank, they would inform us so that we throw it into the pool of conditional grants for the gaps that has been identified to be closed because we are sitting on land that still needs to be developed. Um, this is the scorecard I spoke about. You'll see that if a transaction is not 50% owned by women, that transaction cannot be counted as women owned transactions. We do get transactions where women have 30%, 26%, 40%. That transaction would be classified as male owned. Um, and for our reports, any transaction that we say it is women owned, is either 50% or above. The same with youth. If it is not 50% owned by youth, it is not uh, youth owned. If it is not 6% owned by people with disabilities, it is not owned by people with disabilities. So we cannot report it under such category. And when the gaps are identified, we would then be able to know what to address with the financing institution 
that is partnering with the department to meet those targets. Um, with regard to the grant gliding scale, I have indicated that a portion of the fund would be a grant. We have caps which we have tried to align to the draft policy on producer comprehensive producer support. Um, on the scorecard, you'll see that you have at least 50 points. I'm not going to go through them in the interest of time, but this information is available in our pamphlet, which we can also share this presentation to those who are interested in applying for blended finance. Um, we, for smallholder producers, for production support, we would give up to a maximum of 5 million in grant funding, and for land acquisition, 10 million in grant funding. For medium scale operations, we would give a maximum of 10 million in grant funding and 20%, 20 million in, in, in acquisition, land acquisition. For large scale operations, we would give a grant funding of 40 million and for land 50 million as a cap. This becomes important. One of the examples I like making is the development of a 300 hectare macadamia for a community. So usually that large scale horticultural development requires up to 180 million for the duration of seven years. We are prepared to give up to 40 million and the rest of the funding would be coming from the banking sector, which would have to be repaid by the transaction. If it is a small holder, we would give up to 60% of the total funding required and the bank can come with 40% as a loan. But if it is a medium scale operations, we go 50-50 with an institution. If it is a large scale operation, the institution will have to provide 60% of the total funding required and we can only provide up to 40%. So I have mentioned that we, we will focus on acquisitions. We would focus on existing operations for expansion. We would also finance uh, capital equipment, as well as infrastructure, working capital. We are looking at an insurance scheme for the fund and every beneficiary of blended finance will receive a participating uh, certificate into the insurance provided after the assessment by LBIC. They qualify for that insurance. Um, what is also a, a, a good thing that has happened is that the banking association, as you would know, Every time they've been crying out loud that we need to provide title deeds, they have accepted that long-term lease agreements are sufficient for them to be able to provide their loan funding. So every firm uh, which has proper lease agreements and the required funding is not less than the term of lease would be able to access blended finance. Minister announced the and relaunched the blended finance scheme and announced the trailblazer as the IDC. Um, so currently we have a signed agreement. IDC has already started receiving and they have about 27 transactions they have received, which have passed through their first phase of assessment. What does IDC focus on? It is large scale um, support. It would not change its mandate for blended finance. That is why it becomes important that we must bring on board your land banks, your APSAs, and the other big banks who have already sent uh, letters of expression. We are busy with concluding the bilateral agreements with them. Um, if it is primary production, those other institutions become institutions that you'd need to to focus on. If your operation is in vertically integrated, you are able to access funding from the IDC. But if it is poultry, IDC in line with the poultry master plan, their focus would be on large poultry uh, producers with a minimum of 200 beds per cycle. If it is broilers and a minimum of 50,000 uh, layers where it is um, egg production. How do you access it? You must go directly to the bank. So the department does not get involved at all with the application. You must meet the minimum requirements of the banks. These are also captured in the uh, pamphlet. Um, and the bank would then do the assessment, do the due diligence, take it to the credit committee, having applied our criteria and scorecard and advance the finance that is required as per 
as guided by the grant gliding scale. There is a steering committee which the department is setting up, which is going to oversee the implementation of the program. We would want to know each and every transaction that has been rejected, what has happened to it, where is it, so that we move systematically in trying to make sure that every black person who is on land, that land is assisted and is productive. Um, and this is really our wish. The only thing that would limit us would be the resources, as we all know. Um, the minimum requirements for the banks, as I had indicated, is quite a lot. They have also given guidance in terms of what should be captured in the business plan. But what is important is that any transaction that approaches the bank should at least have been in business for two years within the agricultural sector. But for startups of um, agricultural graduates and so on, their experience in or, or qualifications and knowledge would also uh, work well, but we would also have to make sure that they are supported by strong capacity to ensure that their production is successful. Thank you, Chairperson. I hope I tried to stay within the 15 minutes time that has been provided. Thank you so much uh, for your presentation, very detailed presentation. I also just want to note that we will be accessing, you will be able to access all of these presentations on the department's uh, database and website, um, and that will be made available later today. Thank you so much once again to this presenter. Uh, we look forward to engaging with the questions that have been coming through, and also just a warm welcome to our new Deputy Minister, Zuleika Kappa, who's also just joined us on this call. Um, I do have a few questions that I just want to highlight um, as you were talking, uh, Ms. Matiza, um, there's one that came here from Beverly Farmer saying blended finance exists only on paper and not in reality. Lydia Moheng saying COVID-19 has messed up a lot of our credit worthiness of a lot of small businesses. How does agriculture assist when one is really interested in food security, um, but you do, you're not credit worthy or the business is not doing so well? We are aware of the impact that COVID has had on many small businesses and many small farmers within the country and the rest of the world. Zandi Mataki um, who's saying, it's virtually impossible to access funding for acquisition of farms. I have attempted to get assistance from the department since 1995 till today, even at times when I had documentation from farmers willing to sell and mentor me. The department says that they cannot offer farms to people that are not on their database. The person is saying the minister means well, but the challenge is on delivery. Um, in the interest of time, I know that we are rushing through all the presentations and that um, we, you have so many questions that you want us to answer, but I will now like to call on our next speaker. Um, thank you so much um, for the last speaker. I'd now like to call on our next speaker to join us. Um, it is, just pulling up my notes, apologies. We'll now call on Dr. Gemina Mohen, the Chief Director responsible for the food security and agrarian reform within the department. She will now share with the people on the school the importance of food security for our country and its impact on their livelihoods. Welcome, Doctor, and over to you with your presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Don. Um, <clears throat> I'm hoping I can be allowed the opportunity to share yes um, I'm going to talk on the importance of food security I miss this uh, webinar which is around the role of women in agriculture I have uh, been a uh, requested to quickly touch base on that and I will try as paid other speakers to stick around the time allocated and uh, chair i can't see seem to have my video on so but it's fine we'll give you access to that now doctor we will sort that you. out and in the meantime you continue with your but i will continue in the meantime yes, thank, thank you, you so much for for for, for the opportunity uh, provided and i would like to indicate that the presentation outline is as follows and it will be 
uh, dealt with in the entire presentation where in food security defined up to the availability the involvement of households in agriculture and the impact thereof as well as um, nutrition aspects that relate to what minister also touched upon i was listening so attentively on the uh, um, trick by the grandmother but I, we couldn't get it because we all want to maintain some weight um quickly and uh, thank you very much program director for the opportunity and thank you honorable minister and then honorable deputy minister welcome uh, in the deputy minister the, if uh, they're all here um, women present here you are uh, important and all protocol observed thank you for the opportunity uh, in terms of food security the definition is what we all know that it's a state where all people all at all times have physical social and economic access to food to sufficient safe and nutritious food to meet their dietary needs and food preferences for an active healthy life that that thought matters that do people get the type of food that would meet their dietary requirements or people just eat even energy dense food just to fill their stomachs that's what matters and again food security helps to enhance the productivity and consecutively the food production thereof it can also assist in providing opportunities for income generation now it's a complex and a multifaceted concept which is outlined in terms of these four pillars which are in terms of quantity food availability and food access in terms of food availability how much food is there and in terms of access can we afford the food that is uh, available for us and is it in the manner of our preferences and again we would be knowing that there is also the aspect of grants there that our communities depend entirely or mostly on with around 17.9 million people receiving those again in terms of quality the stability thereof is it stable is it available when we want it and again do we have nutritional value out of our food that we eat is it safe and my colleague that will speak after me now will be talking to that aspects of food safety and aspects of biosecurity and biosafety now in terms of availability as a country we are fine we have been blessed because we have achieved bumper harvest in succession where in in this financial on in this uh, seasonal uh, period we are expecting over 16 million tons of maize which is our staple as a country and this is uh, almost uh, over 795 uh, thousand tons more than the previous seasons 15.3 million tons so this is uh, one of the second largest or the largest uh, crop maize that we have ever harvested as a, as a country and again we have uh, enough to meet our demands and even feed markets that are supply markets that are, are neighboring to us and this is all due to more amongst others favorable weather conditions and in terms of food access we have a uh, statistics sa which does these general household surveys uh, at, a, at a, a national level and this indicates that we have had a decline but i must also be quick to indicate that this is as at 2019 wherein covid 19 had not hit the country in 2020 so we might expect a sharp rise in terms of food access wherein people have to modify their diets on a daily basis because they don't uh, have the ability to eat what they prefer their choices of food is very limited now the reasons thereon continue to say the households get affected because we still see around 12.3 percent of households in pumalanga that are uh, affected by the aspects of food access and followed by northern cape this is funny because limpopo continuously in year in and year out have a lower 
a uh, ability in terms uh, have, have a good ability in terms of uh, adequate access to food as compared to the rest of the uh, provinces including the country average now this is the reason why limpopo continues if you look at the percentage of households that are involved in agricultural activities by province you can see limpopo there leading at 38.2 percent followed by the eastern cape and these are far above the average of the country which is about 15.3 percent involvement of households in agriculture and this has been persistent uh, in terms of uh, this uh, engagement in agricultural activities we still also note the hunger and uh, that affects uh, households and persons there is a clear target by the department to say in this current mtsf we would want to remove the households that are standing at 10.3 percent to 5.7 percent by 2024 this is a targeted intervention which i will speak to in a later slides that follow from here now we are also faced with a challenge as a country of having a stunted children that are having a low height for their age as well as wasting that we find that uh, again here the body weight for the height is very low in these children and this is a problem because this is a um, yeah, children where in one in three children are still stunted and again there's a combination that amongst amidst this mal mal malnutrition we find that there is also an element of overweight where in one in eight children are overweight and i've just put a map there that brings us to the region because we are part of the region uh, which is the SADC, wherein you find that in terms of a uh, prevalence of overweight south africa and botswana find themselves leading so this becomes a concern that we are actually uh, lagging behind uh, 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 in the uh, original perspective you can see the sorry i don't know if you can see but D drc is around four percent so something is not right because we have a lot of maize uh, we have a, 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 a a, a, a sub, a, oversupply of maize but we have the problem of overweight it means there's something that we are not doing correctly there is um, enough food but it's not probably in the sufficient quality now i'm just taking us back my apologies for this i couldn't find a later uh, information but it's for women to say you see at the age of 65 we're seeing agricultural households by age group and head of household gender at the age of 65 we're seeing more women participating in agriculture when you go down to the lower ages the, the numbers are quite low and they are constantly seriously declining and i think this is one of the issues that we would want to encourage because agriculture needs energy you need to have the sufficient energy let alone the attitude to do farming so that you are able to farm effectively so this becomes a concern and i'm sure we will also be tracking the next uh, results in terms of this uh, age aspect of uh, women uh, engaged in agriculture now these are just the indications that as a country we are part of a bigger picture we can't we are not an island we don't operate alone we have the global aspects which guide us in terms of the united nations sustainable development goals we know goals sustainable development goal one uh, uh, two and uh, 12 those are around food production ensuring zero hunger ensuring no uh, food insecurity and therefore we have to toe the line whether we are willing or not because there's expectation out there globally and we also are part of the continent and our uh, minister has been the chair of the stc we know and we have to show that we are in line with all the declarations that have been agreed upon as well as the agenda 2063 and the cut up implementation we must be online and regionally i have already, already touched on this as part of the sadec 
as well as our mandate in terms of the national expectation that we shouldn't let our uh, communities uh, down. And those are the prescripts, one, some of them that guide us. Now, I was saying I was going to talk to the plan which the country has to, towards ensuring that we are able to um, fulfill the mandate of ensuring that it's not only food that we are secure in, but we are also nutritionally secure. Therefore, we have this plan, which is around 2018 to 2023, and is being implemented with all the departments that I will be showing just in my next slide, that wants to ensure that there is optimal food security and enhanced nutrition in the country. And not just food, but the nutritional status thereof. Because in my previous slide, I showed the aspect of wasting, stunting, uh, obesity, overweight. And we are having a problem, though we're having sufficient supplies of food. And then we would want to uh, implement this uh, plan, which is anchored on six strategic objectives, which are implemented, as I said in my earlier slide, that food security is a multi-stakeholder and multifaceted aspect. We will not be able to pull that alone. Hence, it's need, the, hence the need for women participation, men participation, youth participation in terms of ensuring that food is available in sufficient quantities and in, in the required nutritional uh, status. Now, the, uh, the, the National Food and Youth Security Plan is led by the uh, DPME in the presidency. And here we see a, a Food and Nutrition Security Council that will oversee in the country how we want to handle aspects of food insecurity. And as I have said, we, how do we report to those uh, structures that be it globally or continentally or regionally that are expecting us as a country to really lead and uh, we also have us as the department of agriculture land reform and rural development wherein we are leading in the establishment of inclusive local food value chains to support access to nutritious and affordable food you will note the local food value chains wherein we are saying let food be accessible at the local level so ladies produce at where you are don't want to go to another place in cities and so on. Just where you are, make sure that there is sufficient production and you can be able to take care of your food, of your uh, household in terms of uh, its food uh, needs. Then we have the Department of Social Development. You are all aware they are dealing with the grants. And now with the COVID-19, the 350, these are safety nets that are trying to assist and curb the aspects of uh, seeing a uh, gross and uh, a huge gaps of uh, food insecurity and here they want to expand the targeted social protection measures and sustainable livelihood programs as i have just indicated that they provide grants as well as um, the covid 19 response uh, 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 of the 350 and again we have the department of health who are actually talking to issues of nutrition scaling up high impact nutritional interventions targeting women infants and children and i'm sure women will agree with me here that if the mother is not well fed that is where our food system starts because the mother must be well fed so that the breast milk can feed the infant quality breast milk so i think that is the reason why this is specified that these high impact nutritional interventions are targeting women, infants and children. And again, we also have the uh, aspect of uh, influencing people across the life cycle to make uh, informed food and nutrition decisions through an integrated communication strategy. This is where our GCIS and the Department of Health again are leading. And Darald also further leads the development of a monitoring and evaluation system for food and nutrition security in South Africa and establishing an integrated risk management system for monitoring food and nutrition security related risks. This is where we are part of the regional vulnerability and assessment uh, analysis, an, uh, analysis and, assess, and assessment 
a process of the SADC region. Now, I just want to touch uh, on the aspect of employment and gender, which also shows that the country as a whole is not uh, abandoning uh, women. We can uh, see there in that in terms of the quota labor force survey, uh, in terms of quota one, uh, unemployment rates of males and females were comparatively more or less the same with men at 31.4% and women 34%. Uh, uh, percent. But of essence is that uh, African black African women were the most vulnerable with an unemployment rate of 38%. And again, disparities by sex and occupation show that females accounted for 31.2 percent of those op occupying managerial positions this is a, a bit of a concern and in addition more women which was ar around 56.2 percent than men tended to be discouraged from participating in the labor market and the reasons i will quickly provide in the following slides but however in both uh, quarter ones of 2020 and quarter one of 2021 more than four in every 10 young females were not in employment, education, or training. And females were more likely to offer family commitment as a reason for not attending school than males. So we always want to bring our families in front of everything, which is good to a certain extent, but not always a helping uh, the growth and um, progress of women now uh, towards the end uh, chairperson uh the next steps is that we wanting to say the whole of government and the whole of society uh, approach is required for strengthening food security and good nutrition as well as the provision of clean water and decent sanitation national food and security plan embraces this paradigm because you can see it's a collaboration and a collaborative effort of saying how do we bring in school children uh, in terms of the department of basic education that works with the dsd how do we bring in the nutritional aspects how do we increase production now the continuous improvements are required in state-led interventions that are essential to improve food production uh, Member chisa is just presented on the uh, opportunities there and i won't read through all of these that we need to support this uh, household food production we need to support small scale uh, farmers at all levels be it subsistence be it smallholder again the aspect of socio behavioral interventions should be strengthened now i'm speaking on behalf of my colleagues of health that they're even having a breastfeeding week this week that we need to support and, and encourage breastfeeding and we need to also have the complementary feeding and nutrition education and counseling as well as improving hygiene uh, practices now some of our partners who are uh, the un women they have reported that female-headed households in the sub-saharan africa are around 31 percent this is in comparison to latin america and the caribbean where there is about 17 percent of such female-headed households and in Asia where it's, in, it's around 14 percent so this is a challenge for us in the African continent to say we need to up our scales because it means the communities the households depend on us further on the FAO studies have confirmed that women are the mainstay of small-scale agriculture farm labor force and day-to-day -day family subsistence they have more difficulties than men in gaining access to resources such as land and credit and productivity enhancing inputs and services now food security in fact has been defined by the fao but it's not only in terms of access to food availability of food but also in terms of resources distribution to produce food and purchasing power to buy food where it is not produced now in conclusion chair given the women's crucial role in food production and provision any set of strategies for sustainable food security must address their limited access to productive resources security must address their limited access to productive resources such as land thank you so much 
Thank you so much, Dr. Mohen, Chief Director responsible for the food security and agrarian reform within the department. Busi M saying impressive statistics and actually an eye opener um, that you've just shared. Uh, just a reminder to those who may have joined us later, um, all the presentations will be made available on the department's website. And you can of course, of course also visit www.foodformzanzi.co.za um, for more updates on this specific story and post the event. We have one or two comments that I'd just like to share before we ha hand over to the next speaker. Gogo Dupio saying maize as a staple is our challenge. There are other indigenous grains like sorghum that would harness. Another comment from Gogo also saying on household food security, we need to decisively empower and target women over 35. They are the ones making food choices and facing household hunger directly. And this group by default gets left behind. Um, thank you so much, doctor. And I appreciate all your comments. Um, I would like to just ask and call upon our next presenter, Dr. Mpo Maja. She is the director responsible for animal health in the department. And she will now share with everyone here the importance of biosecurity in light of the outbreak of animal diseases in various provinces. Dr. Mbo, please join us now and share your presentation. And I would like to maybe ask you just to cut it a little bit shorter um, in the interest of time. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, uh, Madam Don. I hope that I am audible. Um, yes, I keep it very short. As um, an introduction, perhaps to first um, pass the greetings to Minister, Deputy Minister, and the beautiful ladies um, joining this webinar. And um, I think the coordinators and the program designers of this webinar should have rather made me the food security presenter considering my surname but I will um, continue with the biosecurity presentation. Um, just as an outline to the presentation, I'll first start by explaining what biosecurity is, what it means, and why it is important, as well as how to implement it. As you saw so on the cover slide, I am going to try and simplify it. In Minister's opening remarks, she indicated that most of the information that we pass to the farmers, um, we pass it in an unpalatable or undigestible way. Um, so I'm going to try and use simple English. So what is biosecurity? There is a, a Sesotho South Sesotho word that comes to mind every time I talk biosecurity, and that is hubolela. In English, it means uh, jealously guarding something that you dearly value. Um, English doesn't say it nice as nice as Sesotho says it, but that's basically what biosecurity entails. Um, it's a set of preventative measures that need to be implemented to reduce introduction of diseases onto your farm property, um, to your livestock. So it basically means that you need to do everything that you can in your power to reduce um, such introduction. And we also need to be mindful that um, people, Animals of unknown health status, equipment, vehicles uh, could pose a risk to introduction of diseases. Why is biosecurity important? The English say goes uh, prevention is better than cure. And I think we are all practicing that. Uh, most of the diseases are very erosive, meaning that they cause deaths, either in large numbers or whatever numbers um, that it could be causing in your flock or in your head. But one, one death is one too many, considering that is literally rains that you will be flushing down the drain or you'll be digging a hole to bury. 
They also slow down production. If you are a wool grower, a milk producer, a beef producer, um, production gets uh, severely slowed down. They also cost a lot to control. You have to buy medication. You have to make sure that the sick animals are treated. And for those um, chronic diseases, it becomes even more difficult and more costly to control and try to eradicate. And they also cost um, accesses to markets, be it local domestic markets or international markets where we aim to export. Once you start farming with a disease, um, your ability to access any market becomes um, limited. Some of these diseases are also um, zoonotic, they affect people and they cause varying um, degrees of um, infection or disease to people. So one of the reasons why we need to um, control them. So how do we implement uh, biosecurity in our day-to-day -day use or day-to-day -day living? We have in the last, um, it's probably 510 days now been in lockdown. And there has been lessons that I hope we have all learned from COVID, its prevention and its control. And I've put a disclaimer there deliberately because the one interview that I did at some point back, um, somebody loved to say her uh, animal health is getting um, insight from COVID control. That's actually not the case. We've been doing these things for the longest of times. But what I'm going to do now is to translate what has probably been um, said in difficult English, in English that we hear almost on a daily basis. We hear of things like non-pharmaceutical interventions. And those are interventions that outside of medicines, vaccines can be implemented by us to reduce the spread of any infection. We talk about hand washing and sanitization, we talk about social distancing, we talk about um, limiting gatherings and numbers at gatherings and self-isolation. I will go into details now um, individually with these um, non-pharmaceutical interventions. Just as a start, washing hands and sanitizing with regards to COVID, the main aim is that you physically remove the virus from your hands and you apply hand sanitizer to prevent um, introducing or infecting yourself with the virus or bringing the virus home from the shops, for example, if you have been uh, to the shops. So now let's translate that to, to animals and the farm. So what we need to then do is to prevent introduction of pathogens from other animals, be it your other farm or be it your friend's farm um, to your own animals. So you need to make sure that whatever equipment that you use, be it your hands, be it your uh, nasal tongs, um, your wheelbarrows, they are cleaned every time you move between different camps, between different um, animal groups. Make sure that when people come and visit you, they don't go and say, oh, your pigs look very nice, um, especially if they have pigs of their own, without having gone through a protocol, at least of washing their hands and changing their shoes because they could be transmitting um, material in their shoe soles that could uh, bring in infection. Make sure that any equipment or vehicles come into the farm, uh, cleaned and disinfected, especially uh, feed trucks that move from farm to farm, transporting feed. And um, we as vets and um, other para-veterinary professions that attend to your farm could also be these mechanical transmitters of disease. So just because somebody comes in wearing a stethoscope and a white suit, a white uh, coat, um, calling themselves a professional doesn't mean that they are absolutely safe from bringing infection. 
So you need to also be careful when allowing um, technical people onto the farm that they do not bring infection from the previous farm that they may have visited. And as Don said, there's a number of outbreaks in different provinces. You'd find that I was attending to a farm um, that has avian influenza infection and quickly have to rush to the next farm to investigate and forget to do the necessary washing hands and sanitizing as, as the um, title of the slide says. And then that way I introduce um, avian influenza onto your farm. Then the other um, non-pharmaceutical intervention is social distancing. With regards to COVID, the whole aim is to avoid mixing of people of different infection levels, uh, be it known or unknown. Um, so when we translate that to animals, um, we need to make sure that we confine our animals. Difficult as that could be, especially in rural communities, we need to make sure that at least you crawl your animals uh, particularly at night. If you can afford to do it during the day, even better. We have diseases such as rabies that is um, happily transmitted by stray dogs that find themselves roaming around. Uh, so you need to confine your dogs um, and your cats and your livestock um, so that they are not exposed to these animals. We have diseases like African swine fever that are transmitted by wild roaming pigs, warthogs, and avian influenza transmitted by wild birds and um, normal poultry that just finds its way, especially in, in, as I said, in communal areas where my chickens just run around and um, feed whatever they can get their pigs on. And then the next intervention is that of gatherings. Um, with COVID, it, they are called super spreaders. And that terminology actually explains it very nicely. Um, and when it comes to animal disease controls, it's one of the measures that uh, we become very unpopular when we uh, practice that. The super spreaders when it comes to the livestock industry could be things like shows, in as much as these shows may be high end breeding stock, but you don't know where that bull has been and what the health status of that farm of origin is. Um, gatherings at water points um, where animals share water points such as dams or rivers and um, things like auctions where we bring our animals for auctioning um, to get better market price. The picture that I have deliberately used is one that we um, came up with. It's a true situation of two auctions um, in Limpopo in 2019, end of 2019. The two middle, I hope you can see my case, so the two middle ovals, uh, the actual two, only two auction uh, sessions on the left, it is the suppliers supplying these two auctions. On the right, it is all the buyers. And you can see everybody congregated, everybody bought, and um, FMD nicely spread through the auctions to the different properties. So we need to be very mindful when we visit auctions and when we visit shows that we protect our livestock so that they do not get exposure to animals of disease statuses that are unknown. Then the next measure is self-isolation. Um, so the main aim here is to prevent spreading a disease further. So with regards to COVID, when you start feeling a little headache, a little sniffle, we are encouraged to self-isolate so that you don't um, expose your coworkers or your neighbors. Same applies to animal world. Once you see there is something wrong with your animals, and I take it that as, as the owner of an animal and considering that we are here as ladies, mothers, 
we would be able to notice when there is something not lacquer with our livestock. Please do not send them on um, to an auction to quickly get rid of them and get a quick back because that way you will be distributing possibly a disease. And also, um, I know we ladies like bargains, I'm one of them. Let's not look at or look for bargains at especially auctions. You may be buying a disease onto your farm. So let's try and um, investigate the source of the animals that we would be buying. Make sure that we know the health status at origin before we make that purchase. So in as, as one of the last slides, we need to also understand our risk factors. There are different risks with different farming practices. For example, the risk factor for pigs, for pig farming would not be the same as risk factors for chicken farming, for example. However, there are general factors um, which apply across the board. The first one being confining the animals, making sure that they do not make contact with animals or birds of a lesser or unknown health status. Second being allowing visitors, especially if they have their own animals, same as yours, onto your farm without uh, going through the necessary uh, precautions. And most importantly, buying from unknown sources. Make sure that you buy from reputable sellers and preferably that whatever you buy comes with an attestation or a certificate attested to by a professional, not an owner declaration saying that I think my pigs are healthy, therefore please buy them. Um, and there are other risk factors which are specific and unique to different uh, diseases, for example, um, vector transmitted diseases such as um, vectors being ticks, you get um, diseases like African swine fever that is transmitted by ticks, you get African horse sickness that is transmitted by uh, biting or culicoides, which are little midges, uh, rift valley fever that is transmitted by mosquitoes. So in, in your implementing biosecurity measures, make sure that these uh, vectors are covered. You either apply um, insect repellent so that uh, mosquitoes don't bite your ship, or you make sure that your styes are constructed in such a way that ticks do not have access to your pigs to transmit the virus. Um, and then there's also very, um, other specific uh, risk factors that I think most uh, pig farmers do apply, and that is feeding kitchen waste. This is most important. We have so far had um, quite a number of African swine fever cases being reported, and upon investigation, the majority of them are as a result of feeding kitchen waste. We have been fortunate that it has been transmitting African swine fever and not other diseases, such as foot and mouth disease and um, what we call PERS. It's a porcine respiratory and reproductive disease. It causes massive abortions and massive deaths in pigs. So if you do not have the means of buying commercial feed, make sure that you cook the kitchen waste or um, kitchen food such that all these viruses are destroyed. We encourage cooking for not less than an hour, so allow it to boil for about an hour. That should ensure that all of these hohakis are destroyed. And I think that brings me to the end of the presentation. Um, thank you, Don. Thank you so much, Dr. Mbomaja, the Director for Animal Health within the department. Um, I think so many of the challenges that new farmers specifically face is specifically around uh, related to outbreaks of animal diseases. So you've given us lots to think about and so many interesting aspects that we can touch on and highlight. And of course, these presentations will be made available um, later if you'd like to access the information that Dr. Mbo shared. Um, just one or two comments that I'd like to share before I hand over to our next presenter. 
um, Magwen is saying, how can we ensure clean water flocked by the farmer? Gogo Tupio also saying that there was a time in our rural villages where our calendars had routine animal dips by state vets for both livestock and pets. Um, this helped our communities to be able to manage our communal, communal bio footprints or biosecurity as well managed and pre prevented. So just a few comments coming there post your presentation, Dr. Rupo. We look forward to engaging you a little bit later with some of the other questions that came through. I would now like to call on Ms. Rendani Sadiki um, to share our next presentation. Um, also just kindly to please keep it short. We are limited a bit in terms of time and we would like all the presenters to have as much time as possible. So I now call on our next presenter. Thank you so much. Also, I think there is a possibility for you to switch on your cameras. We'd like to see your beautiful faces. We are celebrating women. So please feel, feel free to also switch on your camera when you are presenting. Uh, okay. Um, good afternoon, um, Don and the minister, deputy ministers and the, the um, collective that is here. My name is Rendani Sadiki, the CFO of the Department of Agriculture, uh, Land Reform and Rural Development. I will be talking to you on matters of procurement, the set asides for women. A bit uh, difficult, uh, <laughs> a bit difficult um, um, topic to talk about, um, given the challenges that we are having around the uh, legislation on this part, although we have quite a number of announcements that have been made on us uh, taking care of women when we do the procurement for um, the public sector. So I just to start, I just wanted to speak on the statistics. Um, the statistics in 2020 indicated that uh, of approximately 59.3 million of South Africans, we've got women uh, constituting about 30, uh, 30 million. So that's above the 50%. Uh, of, of our, our our population is made up of women, and therefore it it does uh, give impetus on why we need to prioritize women when we are doing procurement in the public sector. Um, we 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 know that uh, we cannot have a revolution without women, and we certainly cannot have a democracy without women, because already half of our society is made up more than half of our society from the states above is made up of, of women. We also know that the agenda, um, the U African Union agenda of 2063 uh, calls for the allocation of at least 25% of public procurement uh, to women owned businesses. So again, we see the importance coming through even at a, an, an African Union level. Um, we know that our um, president, uh, His Excellency President Cyril Ramaphosa, uh, last, uh, when he was uh, giving his acceptance uh, uh, statement at the African Union, he also uh, spoke about uh, the fact that it's not unreasonable to advocate for the preferential public procurement legislation uh, for, for, for us to advantage women owned business and for the establishment of procure preferential trade and customs regime for women. So again, we're seeing it coming through from the highest level of a leadership in the country that we need to enforce uh, the, the, the procurement, um, a preferential procurement for women um, at that level. And again, last year, I looked at his speech when he was talking last year on, 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 the, on, on, on the 9th of August, he again, uh, announced that uh, from now we, as part of government commitment to gender equality, uh, they will be expanding access of women to economic opportunity by setting aside at least 40% of public procurement for women owned business. And we are expected to, we were then expected to uh, come up uh, to start to monitor and report on how many women have participated in each public procurement process. Uh, for that, we were given 12 months, which means 
Today, our 12th month has expired, but I'll speak to that as we go forward. We, we, we had the triple PFA Act uh, that uh, had an amendment regarding the 30% set aside on the pre-qualification criteria when we we are adjudicating on, on, on bids or public, public procurement. Um, we were allowed to set aside as a pre-qualification criteria and say we can, we can allocate it, um, 30% in terms of points when we are adjudicating to at least companies that are more than 51% and more to black uh, uh, women or, or businesses that are owned by black women or by youth or people uh, living in rural areas or cooperatives or by black military veterans. But this uh, part of the amendment was challenged in court and the ruling was that the amendment was unconstitutional. So we had a setback there. Um, because now the only legislation that could help us to try and set aside a certain work for, for women-owned businesses has now been declared unconstitutional. And Treasury was then ordered to amend the act and make sure that it becomes constitutional. What then Treasury did was to uh, write to us that in the 12th month that they were given through the order, we can continue to use the uh, the triple PFA amend, amended act to enforce the 30% set aside. Now that we are using that, but the challenges are the fact that you still have the normal uh, section 217 of your constitution where you must ensure that there's fairness, there's competitiveness, and there's the legislation that relates to to, to um, compliance is still as is. So when we do adjudication and we evaluate these things, the company that comes first still gets to be awarded uh, the, 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 the bid. Uh, we are, of course, looking forward to the amendment, um, but there are issues that we, we, we still feel needs to be attended to because as part of the con uh, conditions of, of subcontracting or, or the 30% the, the, uh, set aside, you need to inform bidders where they will find relevant companies who will be qualifying for subcontracting. So there's a whole lot of issues that still need to be resolved with regards to this. And of course, we, we are looking forward to the finalization of the public procurement bill because at least it's it does, it's more stricter uh, on, on issues of ensuring the, there is the um, leveraging of the uh, uh, procurement to advance opportunities for previously disadvantaged people, especially women, youth, and people with disability. So at least if the, the, the procure, uh, Public Procurement Act uh, or bill comes into force, as a legislation, and we have this uh, directly sitting there, it should be able uh, to, to assist us because there they are saying the minister will be required to prescribe, the, to prescribe a framework for preferential treatment for uh, certain categories, uh, and that includes women. Uh, in the previous reporting cycle, um, um, it cycles. Um, we, I think I took from um, 2019, 2020, 2020, 2021, I tried to do two years because last year was a, uh, not a stable financial year because we had three months where we had full lockdown and we came back and we were still not too 100% um, effective because of the introduction of COVID. And we, we had not stabilized and we did not know what to do under the circumstances. So I took two years so we can see that in the previous year, there was a normal procurement, uh, but in this current uh, last financial year of 2020-2021, we had a bit uh, what we normally procure, the level at which or the value uh, which we procure was a bit lower uh, because of the coronavirus. So we, in the, um, this 
period we had a um I will still speak to to the to the uh, statistics. We did not reach the forty percent that we we were expected to reach, and for the various reasons that I've spoken about, the triple PFA, the fact that we currently do not have a, leg a legislation that says set aside the forty percent. So although you have an announcement, it's not backed up by legislation. And when you are therefore applying the current legislation uh, that is there, you do not, um, you cannot um, achieve the compliance that is required. And these things are audited. So you are in between a hard rock and a, um, um, a hard place. This was the, the procurement uh, in 2020, 2019-2020, um, where we procured at least 1.4 billion uh, worth of, 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 of uh, procurement um, in the public sector, in the department. And the skewedness is that in 20, in uh, 2020, we were still two different departments, and now we have merged into one department. Um, I think I didn't uh, say it uh, properly. But, uh, and then in 2019, 2020, this is how it was made up of. We had 1 billion uh, total value of 1 billion, and you can see the total awards were 111, and 25% went to women and 75% went to, my, my presentation is gone. Thank you so much. Um, I didn't finish. Uh, I, I understand, I just want to ask to assist you with the presentation um, in the meantime. Oh, it's back, can you see it? Uh, not yet, ma'am, but hopefully soon. Can you see it now? Not completely yet, but um, I see, there we go. There, the presentation is back. Thank you so much. Uh, I, okay. Um, we, we had 75% uh, was awarded to, to men and there is the skewedness I was talking about. Uh, sorry for the heading, this is 2019, 2020. Um, uh, which was a full operational year where we were operating. And therefore the non-compliance came in when even when we were fully, we were at 25% of the 1 billion total value. Only uh, um, a certain amount went to women, which is non-compliance. Uh, in terms of value, it was 632 million, which is 58%. And in terms of uh, males, they've got 434 million, which is 42%. But when we go back to the awards themselves, the number of tenders, it was 25% to women and 75% to men. So I did not know how to, to, to make it. Perhaps if we look at value-wise, women got more money. But if we go to the number-wise, men got more tenders than women. Um, then in the current, uh, just the year that we have passed now, uh, we had a total amount of 182 million. Now we tried and put it per province because we wanted you to see that certain provinces are doing well. You look at Northern Cape at 51% and uh, um, Limpopo coming in at 20%, which is quite very low with the Northwest at 15%. Uh, and the national department uh, at 46%. And the, in total of the 182 million, uh, 27 million went to women. So we're not really doing much well, but I think the most important thing is the fact that we need a legislation um, that would encompass fully the issue of the set aside, because we have the legislation that Normally when you are audited, you get audited in terms of the legislation. Um, 
and th then the compliance issues becomes quite uh, critical. Uh, whereas we have the announcement that says you need to do this. So there is a bit of disjuncture in terms of having a legislation and announcement and implementation. But what we are trying to do is to use what we have, although when you then come to decision of deciding whether to give it to a woman or not to a woman, the compliance issues come in. Um, these are the things that we normally procure and we normally find most of the women at this level. Uh, it's in, in, in um, CIDB, which is construction, and we've got agriculture inputs, equipment, livestock, medication and feeds, consultant services, catering, cleaning, security, uh, travel and events, promotional items, uh, CETA contracts, and maintenance of the buildings. Uh, one would ask, uh, why is our budget then so high and the procurement very low? There is a, already, there are things that we do not procure as a department, which cost quite a lot, uh, things like your accommodation, um, rates and taxes and municipal services, those uh, do not go through uh, the normal procurement. And also on, it, over and above, we then have the, a lot of work that we do uh, through grants that do also not go through the procurement process. Now, in conclusion, uh, it's just an indication of what I've already said that we are using the Triple PFA Act and that is, I think, uh, about to expire considering the, the ruling uh, that has been uh, issued that in 12 months, it would completely need to be replaced. And I know that the National Treasury is working on this. Um, we are also developing our sourcing strategy. We have a draft, we presented it, and uh, we are amending it. And once it's finished, uh, we should be able to give preference to empower women, uh, albeit with the challenges that I have indicated when I started presenting that although we want to do this legislation and more especially the Public Procurement Act um, or bill, uh, once it comes into effect and we then give given a, a way on how to implement, we should see uh, this uh, um, moving. I must just indicate that this is only the part of the supply chain process. We have the work that is done by other core uh, uh, businesses that we did not include here, where we also prioritize women. Uh, one would be the PESI, the Presidential uh, Employment Stimulus Package that uh, we have just um, allocated. I think, uh, um, if not mistaken, it's over 60% went to women. Um, even in value and in number. So all other uh, programs of the department does prioritize women. And therefore, although they are not through the supply chain uh, process, procurement process, there is more of a emphasis on uh, giving preference to women with all our other uh, programs that we run in the department. Thank you. Thank you so much once again, Ms. Serendani Sadiki, Chief Financial Officer at the Department of Agriculture, Land Reform and Rural Development. Just two comments that I'd like to share before I hand over to our next speakers. The one comment coming from Nozipo Bekani saying, Ms. Rendani, we appreciate the department thinking about women. We ask that you consider paying deposits or making PO funding available that has low charges. The challenge I have experienced is that the institutions that offer funding for POs take a long time to approve and they charge interest that are way more than fair interest. Also, please try to pay, it, pay within seven to 14 days after delivery to avoid SME incurring interest over a long period of time. I have one more comment that I'd like to read. Makwena Mabula saying, women need more orientation on how to attain a subcontract status. Thank you so much once again, Ms. Rendani. And we look forward to seeing your presentation also that will be available on the department's website. So anyone who missed any of the details and everything of the best.
I would now like to call on our next speakers, Mama Fukudi and Ms. Mape Wampe, who will share some perspective of women in the agricultural sector. I now hand over to you and your presentations. Ms. Rendani, can we ask that you stop sharing your screen so we can make room available for our other speakers? Thank you so much. Are other speakers ready and available? I think you are muted. <laughs> Always so tricky with the Zoom, Zoom and technology. You have to unmute your mic now. <laughs> All right. Okay. There we go. Perfect. Okay. Yes. Um, oh, I was waiting for a long time. <laughs> uh, good, good day, all beautiful women in agriculture. I'm Mampi Mereki from Temareta Pigari Project, the Lancia Quichat Farm in Nigel. I have 18 years of farming in all aspects. I am a woman of integrity, a hungry to feed nation. I have only three things for our agriculture to help us as a woman and a young woman whom we busy developing. The youth is struggling to have farms near plots. As we have 138 plots that are not utilized in counting under a public works. Are you still hearing me? Hello? Do you hear me? Yes, ma'am, we can still hear you very clearly and you look so beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, please, Minister, help those young women. They are fully skilled. Uh, the size one fits all will never help us grow the economy of this country. Neither to be uh, commercials, we need proper help so as to help other small farmers. Markets are galore, but no production. Women uh, uh, till the soil, not the nails. We, so we need your intervention agently. We have an organization of women in agriculture that need your intervention as our mother. We are, as, a, as our mother, uh, we are where we are are uh, today because of exchanging and sharing information with other women. Please intervene. Malcolm X says, when you build a woman, you build a nation. Okay. To my beautiful, beautiful agricultural women, uh, I've got an advice for you. I think I will be very, very short, very short. Uh, my advice for the women so that we can be strong and invited other women, because if you are working, other women, they will see you and then they will be maybe, uh, uh, they will have a passion maybe to follow you in agriculture. Women, if you want to be successful in farming, please follow this. It's a four principle of farming. Be on time. Whatever you are doing, be on time. Farm on the standard and smart. Follow all farming protocols without waste and farm with love and joy. Watinta Abafazi, Watinda Imbo Award. Oh, thank you so much. I think uh, uh, it's, it's, it's my short story. Thank, thank you. you so much for sharing your story, Mama. Um, you radiate so much beauty and we are honored to have you on this call and sharing your journey in the agricultural sector. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. 
Um, I now would like to call on Mama Fudi. Um, is she available to speak? Can you turn your camera on and mic on and we will now give over to you. Mafokude, are you available? Otherwise, we will move on to our next speaker. Okay, I think in the interest of time, I would now like to call on our next speaker. Um, and this one is specifically around the state of the state economy and opportunities for women within the agricultural sector. I'd like to call on De Dr. Uh, Tembi Klaba. Uh, the CEO of the Decidious Fruit Development Chamber of South Africa um, to now share the presentation. Um, thank you so much. Um, and good afternoon to uh, Minister, Deputy Minister, um, participants in the room. Um, I think um, the facilitator has been um, alluding to the fact that we need to be short as possible um, without having to be repetitive. Um, as you would recall that some of the presenters already presented on opportunities for women. Uh, mine will take a sort of a different tangent um, without delving much into the actual state of the economy, because I think being here as a collective and as women, we do understand that um, we continue to be marginalized as the economy grows, uh, the uptake of women participation in the economy is not equal to the percentage in which the economy is growing. Um, so the, the brief was, I need to cover entrepreneurship in agriculture and also what is the sector doing at this stage? Uh, what are the initiatives? Um, and this is quite fundamental because we continue to navigate from categories uh, of subsistence, uh, livelihood, sustainability, um, food security to commercialization. And all of these categories, they really speak to the core of what women do from having to um, provide for the households to selling a surplus uh, to being commercial. But then agriculture as a capital investment is really premised on land and water. Um, and it is quite pleasing to see that there was a presentation on land and how policy influence, um, policy can influence that women get to um, have more access to land. So as the DFDC, uh, we fall within the umbrella of the fruit um, SA, um, Decisions Fruit Development Chamber under Hot Grow. And in 2018, appreciating and understanding that the, there was a slow participation of the previously disadvantaged being black, black producers and historically disadvantaged being women, uh, the platform that uh, we are a collective, uh, we as a collective today. And, and, and we came up with four strategic objectives. Um, it, that was in 20. 18. Um, 10 years uh, in 2028, uh, we as the industry, we would want to see an increase in participation in the domestic and export market, um, an increase in participation of black growers, improve the quality and livelihood of fruit workers, and broaden the increase in the participation in the value chain. Uh, there's an appreciation in that every time we talk about opportunities, we speak of primary production and we tend to neglect the value chain. We neglect the fact that there's export agents, there's agro-processing facilities. And uh, we always find this is where the money is. And more often because we are not so focused um, in broadening you know, the downstream, downstream and upstream um, you know, our focus always remains at a, at a primary level. And 30%, I think it becomes a, a global target. Um, I was listening to Rendani presenting on, on a target of 30%. And we believe 30% is a realistic target as well um, in that 30% of exports should be from black producers. Equally so, it should be inclusive um, that 30% of 
of, of women, uh, participation of women. So at this stage is the industry, we, we have the following um, transformation initiatives, which is leveraging funding um, opportunities and um, training and capacity building, which I will come to it. I know it's a broad term and, and partnership and lobbying. And the, the rationale really around um, leveraging funding is when you go back to the value of agriculture as an asset class, um, you, you will not move until you have funding. Um, and just in summary, um, you know, one did try and explain um, what is agriculture as an asset class, you know, from land to biological asset to human capital as well. I mean, investing in skills to develop the sector and the economy, that is an asset as well. There's also investment that is unaccounted for. I always talk of grants that government puts into the sector. Um, at times it's un, it is un, unaccounted for. And depending on the industry, um, the fruit industry being a long-term investment horizon, it, quite capital intensive with high risk, but with high returns, at times it's quite difficult to leverage funding. There's the issue of scale that always comes into play, um, whether small scale, commercial or cooperatives. Uh, but when you, when you leverage funding, um, we, we've engaged with some funders who will say, we'll not look at any investment which is less than 2 million US dollars. And just by that statement, you really appreciate the fact that, you know, the design and the mandate of this fund um, excludes, will exclude your, 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 woman, your, your women in the sector that are startups or that are in the growth phase within the industry. Um, I did touch on the rationale for unlocking funding, but most importantly, um, at, you know, transformation mandate is always linked to unlocking barriers to entry. And uh, whether you read it from a development finance perspective, from a policy perspective, um, finance remains a core in terms of uh, in terms of barriers to entry. Um, that includes your, your your access to land. Now, if we we are to approach an inclusive system um, in terms of entrepreneurship. Um, I think as women, uh, <clears throat> we, we undervalue, um, we underestimate the value of social capital. Um, that social cohesion, which we deem as currency. Um, you, you may want to follow projects, um, be it CASP projects, Ilima, Litsima, where there's a high failure rate. Uh, for example, you'll find that people who have left the project um, are not women. So women will still remain in the project um, and carry the project through regardless of the challenges that the project um, is, you know, the project is facing. So the, the resilience, um, um, it's, it's quite inherent in women in, when they approach businesses. I think from household, um, to businesses, um, that attribute, um, we, we cannot put it in value in terms of currency, but it's, it, it really comes out when you, when you look at projects um, that, that, that are sustainable. And in essence, it reduces disparities in wealth and income, and people engage in common enterprise, whether be it a cooperative, um, a joint venture, and you will find that women who are individual farmers on their own, they have that social cohesion value in that they will also uplift other women. And here we're saying it's an inclusive system because it, it then taps into the inclusive economy, although you, you can't put a rent value on it, uh, but it does, um, I call it an aggregator, an accelerator. Um, in terms of realizing, you know, the power of women in, in entrepreneurship. Then there's the issue of human capital. And at this stage, uh, within the Commodity Association, we have diverted our training solely to focus on enterprise development. Um, we, we appreciate the work that government is doing. Uh, we did not want to repeat uh, the same training. So, our training at this stage is focused on governance, the role of directors, 
uh, trust, you know, you go to some equity schemes and you realize people are disempowered. Um, they can't even participate meaning, meaningfully and do not even understand what level of ownership or profit they should be deriving, either as black producers or as women. Um, we, we've accelerated training on tax compliance, um, uh, training on labor legislation, but governance as a whole, the rationale here is to say, we want to be entrepreneurs. And in us being entrepreneurs, we need to think business sense. We need to be thinking profit making. And all of that um, comes with being skilled in approaching a project, whether it's grant funded, uh, whether there's blended finance, is approaching a project as a business. And the financing mechanism as well, the support that we're currently providing um, within the industry is that of a business development support, uh, market access and finance readiness. So in terms of assisting producers um, and women to package funding applications, to speak to funders, to speak to banks, um, this is one of the product offerings uh, that we have. And of course, uh, patient capital as well um, is embedded in our value proposition when we approach when we approach funders so uh, in summary this slide is is trying to crystallize uh, what you call an inclusive uh, system approach in terms of uh, entrepreneurship and, and opportunities um, that one can can speak of within the industry um, as i said um, in a dawn, um, I've tried to limit the, the presentation, uh, otherwise I would have been rep repetitive. But in conclusion, you know, crystallizing opportunities ha has a gray area. Although one appreciates that with COVID-19, it has been quite an investment shy environment, but more appetite is now on impact investment and diversity. And this is where women can now play in the space. Because when you look at uh, the funding mandate for impact investors and, and, and embedded in it is diversity, uh, one overemphasizes the fact that this is where we need to raise our hands. The structural exclusions, which is the asset base that will be talking to land, water, indeed inhibits women from participating in the mainstream economy. However, in our conclusion, we, we continue to remind the sector or oh, to push back. 30% remains a goal. We will be judged 10 years later to realize that, for example, I'm in an economy industry that, has, that commands 14 billion um, in economy. And to, for me to say at times I'm quite embarrassed if you were to ask me how many percent of that goes towards women or is owned by women. It's quite nominal. And, 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 and as the industry, we've, we've appreciated and understand that dilemma or that shortfall, and we are currently working on it. Uh, once again, women can capitalize on social cohesion as a currency. Uh, capacity building will require a strength and enterprise focus. So we, we, as women, we also need to take the financial risk with the objective of earning profit. Um, um, I know we come from a history where we will wait for government uh, to provide grant, but let us allow women who are still at a subsistence level to look for grants. However, when we have been supported, we then focus on our horizon, on having to look for soft capital. Um, to grow our businesses. But then finance readiness is fundamental. So we cannot continue to shy away from funders as, to, as opposed to government grant dependence. And um, that, that, is the, <clears throat> that is the summary of my, of my presentation in that <clears throat> it's really premised on, on capacity building. It's premised on funding opportunities. Um, it's premised on the paradigm shift uh, to what level do we strengthen our ability um, to raise capital 
And also, what are we focusing on when we're saying we want to leverage our skills and, and access finance? Um, and once again, um, I would like to thank the, the, the opportunity to present. Um, I will take questions when, when there's time. As I said, I did not want to repeat what has been shared by other presenters, but rather to take a, 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 a direction in which it will really focus on entrepreneurship and opportunities. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Tenby. We appreciate all of your insights. And um, we will actually get straight into the question. So if you don't mind staying on the line, we have Felita asking, saying as much as most of the intervention looks like one, market access, financing access, and technical and business capacity building. The more bigger challenge by black farmers when, above, when the above three instruments are secure, it is black farmers accessing science and technology tools to enable climate change management and adaptation and yield management. For example, weather prediction models, diseases prediction models, access to cultivars that are drought resistant. Um, so, so there's just one comment coming through there for you, Dr. Tembu, based on your presentation and what you shared today. So thank you so much. Um, we do have a few more questions and I'd maybe also like to call on the people who raised their hands during this discussion to now switch on their mics if they have specific questions. In the meantime, I will um, raise one or two points that also came across here. Uh, Pinky Modisani saying we registered for the PESAVA program about a year ago and were informed that there would be an inspection to, to ensure that there is production. To date, no one came, no one communicated. Please provide feedback. I'm not sure um, whether Minister Tokuridiza would like to respond to this one. Deputy Minister also on the line. Um, so some feedback or requests there in terms of the uh, PESA, PESA program and also information about that. Um, can that we call on? By Jemina Mueng uh, Don. Yes. Apologies, Minister. Uh, Don, sorry, I was saying Jemina Mueng will respond on the PESA question. Okay. Jemina, you're still on the line. Would you like to respond to that question? Uh, yes, um, the, which province is the question uh, coming from? The province but, is not indicated. The person is just, I uh, think it's Pinky. If you can just comment again to say which province you're located uh, for Gemini to respond. Um, in the meantime, I have another comment coming here from Emily saying women are the backbone of the society. Uh, may the department should uh, give land parcels to women for production, support our one woman, one hectare campaign to utilize the land. Um, is there anyone else who'd maybe like to raise a question? Those who raise their hands in the meantime. Okay, I'll go to the other questions in the chat group so that we can see how they could maybe be responded by the participants that are here. Chair, if I may respond quickly to the PSC one. Yes, you are more than welcome. Thank you very much, uh, Don. The PSC uh, process is still ongoing in terms of verifications. Uh, that is why I was asking uh, in which provinces the um, uh, lady uh, coming from, because in KZN, the figures are still quite high. We were as at um, 6th of uh, August, still having around 24,000 beneficiaries that we have not um, verified, but verifications are back on track now. And if Pinky has already been visited and awaits now the award of the voucher, that process is on hold a bit because we have applied for rollover from National Treasury, assisted by the CFO who was presenting now, uh, Mesa Diki, and then we are awaiting that. There is a hope that we will get some funding, and then we will just then uh, support the vouchers that are outstanding as of uh, uh, March uh, 2021. Thank you very much, Chair. 
Thank you so much, Jemina. Uh, there was also another question here. From I can respond. Okay, sorry, it's Tembi Taba here. I can quickly respond to the question okay. around cultivate development because um, I think it's one of those uh, which you call an exclusion in the sector in inverted commas where um, black producers will be given inferior, inferior cultivars uh, whilst um, other commercial farmers, um, they get, you know, to procure good cultivars. So as the industry within the DFTC, we've signed a memorandum of agreement with the Agricultural Research Council. So the question was more technical, but I will still respond to it uh, because it addresses just that, you know, uh, research, research dissemination, but most importantly, to, 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 to promote cultivar development and inclusiveness in the cultivar economy. Um, in that a cultivar that does well in Limpopo, a black producer in Limpopo should have that cultivar, it should not be an exclusion to a designated grouping. Um, this is the work that we are doing at an operational level, um, at a technical level, but through our MOA with the Agricultural Research Council, we are trying to to close that, that inequality um, uh, of black producers or women not having access to, to proper or good quality cultivars. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Tembi. I see there's another question that came through for you specifically. This question saying, can you please expand on the, on the criteria and processes for support on women-owned business requiring of business support on raising capital. Maybe just a little bit more information. I know your presentation was quite detailed, but if you could just share those highlights again. Um, so for, for the DFTC, in terms of the, now we're getting to the detailed memorandum of incorporation, you need to be a deciduous fruit producer um, to, to or be in the value chain uh, to, to get the assistance. Um, however, we equally available when we, we are approached with advice. For example, you will have members who haven't even planted a single hectare um, of, of, of apples and we are, we are available to provide advice. So what I can do is also just to share our admin um, email address or on, on, on the screen chat. Uh, so that those direct questions can then be directed to, to the office. I think many of the other questions also involved, you know, accessing information at the various departments. So, so if there's anyone who'd like to maybe respond to that, um, Pinky also saying that it's facing how 10, the comment coming through from there as well. Remember all these presentations and the, the panelists to discuss the, the, the details today will be available on the department's website if you missed anything. Um, during today's discussion. I know that's been a long day. Um, Minister, I see you switching on your camera. Would you like just to, to add something there? Yes, thank you very much, Don. I just wanted to uh, say that there are issues that have been raised, particularly some of those that border on ethics and corruption, uh, which one lady raised on the chat group to say uh, she was asked a percentage by one of our officials. I would like uh, her to send directly to my office, you know, the name of the individual so that indeed there can be consequence management because our role as public servants, whether as ministers, deputy ministers, or even officials who are here to serve our people, not to be able to extort funds, you know, for whatever purpose, because there are systems and processes where there is a benefit that must go to beneficiaries, it must go to beneficiaries, not to ourselves, who are the ones that render that service. It's one of the issues that President Ramaphosa has raised in the beginning of his sixth administration, that we want to have a capable state that actually has integrity and that we deal with issues of corruption and any malfeasance that may be there. So I want to put that on the point. Secondly, there are issues of time delays that uh, have been raised by members to say, you know, they have applied for assistance either for land 
assistance they've not been uh, responded to. These are matters that we're trying to deal with within our own system because we have acknowledged that this is one of the challenges. Another member on the chat, chat group rather had asked the question whether they can apply for CASP, Comprehensive Agricultural Support Program nationally. I want to advise the member that you no, know, they cannot apply nationally they have to go through their province because this is the division of revenue. So these funds, when they come, they actually are designated to go through provincial systems for allocation. Yes, we work with the provinces, but the application is actually done at the provincial level. Thank you very much. Uh, those are the few, I know we will try and respond to some of the many questions and su take suggestions that have been made by uh, participants in this webinar. Given the time, we may not be able to answer to all of them. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Minister. Um, I know that the questions were coming in from the start of the session and there are so many. So we will definitely see how we can incorporate them and also ensure that you get the response. Um, so thank you so much, Minister, for, for, that, for, that, for that update as well. Um, I would now like to call on Ms. Lebo Botzeleng, who will do the vote of thanks, um, and then we will wrap up today's session. Lebo, are you available? If you could just switch on your mic and camera for the vote of thanks. I think um, Lebo might be having some technical issues. Um, so I think as it stands, uh, we can um, thank all the speakers that are, have joined us here today. Um, I'd also like to thank our partners that was part of this event, uh, Fruit SA, as well as Total. Um, we'd like to thank them for participating and in this engaging discussion today. And to all the speakers who joined here, Honorable Minister, Deputy Minister, we thank you for taking the time out um, to join us here as well. Um, all the uh, senior officials in the department as well. Um, thank you so much. We, uh, we understand that your time is limited. So it was an honor to be here and to have you here today. Um, thank you so much to all the participants, all the questions, as we just mentioned, we will be able to respond and we will share all the presentations um, that, that was presented here today on the department's website as well. I think the sector continues to attract a more aspiring female farmers um, and agriculturalists really nurturing um, the diversity and change. And, and at Food from Zanzi, and my belief is that the future farmer in this country is female. Um, and I think today also just showcases the fact that the sector in itself is living up its, to its responsibility to encourage equality and promote equity and parity, and also self-care within the agricultural sector, because remember, we are the leaders um, and, and that we should also think about ourselves a little bit. So if you need to put yourself first, um, even if it's just the small things that you do, try to do that as well, especially during Women's Month. So thank you once again. Um, we would like to thank you for joining and engaging on this platform and enjoy the rest of your Women's Month and have a beautiful rest of the day. Thank you so much. Thank you, bye-bye. Thank you, thank you, bye.